That way you can see what they turn into. Well, I see that it's six o'clock and so let's get started. So hello everyone and welcome to the August NASA Night Sky Network member webinar. We're hosting tonight's webinar from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco, California and uh, points elsewhere distributed around the country. We're very excited to have our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Kelly Korick from NASA, NASA headquarters. Welcome to everyone joining us on the YouTube live stream. We're very happy to have you with us. These webinars are monthly events for members of the NASA Night Sky Network. For more information about the NASA Night Sky Network and the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, check out the links in the chat that we'll put in here momentarily. Before we introduce Kelly, here's Dave Prosper with just a few announcements. You're still muted, Dave. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's what happens when you put your notes up in front of the part that sells you to mute. Anyway, hi everyone. Uh, I'll keep it quicker now. First, you can become a NASA partner Eclipse ambassador. So make a difference in your community while celebrating solar science. A little bit like we're doing tonight. You can apply to become an official NASA partner Eclipse ambassador. And for the upcoming uh, annual in 2023 and uh, 2024 total solar eclipses crossing the United States and parts of North America. Um, so there's a partnership between uh, that NASA is partnering amateur astronomers with undergraduate students to engage around 500 underserved communities that are off the central path of the eclipses, uh, which will this training will occur both before and between these events. and. Uh, by uh, you can help a mentor a local undergraduate student and you train together with others across the country in a three week virtual workshop and you'll learn new tools and techniques for explaining eclipses and inspiring awe and then engage your underserved audiences with outreach and you will of course receive a generous toolkit full of materials to enhance your outreach which of course will include hundreds of safe solar viewing glasses and lots of hands-on activities and you'll also be connected with local organizations that'll help you connect with folks and recognize your commitment to, and we'll also recognize your public astronomy engagement with special badge and certificates. We'll be also supported by us at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, who are committed to helping everyone enjoy the wonder and science of solar eclipses everywhere. You can apply at eclipseambassadors.org. So do that, it'll be very fun. And just in case you're wondering, uh, yeah, once you train everyone and introduce the science, if you do want to go look at the eclipse afterwards, you certainly can. Some folks might have had a little bit of confusion. So, <laughs> And uh, the other uh, little bit I just want to say is if, like me, you have also received a whole bunch of UFO reports over the weekend, um, there was another Starlink launch. Um, so you can just tell people that was a Starlink launch, send them a link to your favorite or least favorite picture of them, and uh, be on their way. And that's really all there is. Uh, there's lots more, of course, but let's get started. Yeah, back to you, everyone. All right. Thanks, Dave. For those of you on Zoom, you can find the chat window and the Q&A window at the bottom edge of your Zoom window on your desktop. Please feel free to greet each other in the chat window, making sure that you select everyone in that little button. There's a little pull down menu. And so select everyone. If you don't, it's just going to the only people that are going to see your greetings are the four of us that are on screen. Also, you can let us know in the chat if you're having any technical difficulties. You can also send us an email at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org. If you have a question for Dr. Quark, you can put that into the Q&A window. That really helps us to keep track of all your questions and also whether we've answered them or not. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit record again here. Hey, welcome to the August webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Dr. Kelly Korik to our webinar. Dr. Korik is a scientist in the Heliophysics Division at NASA headquarters, where she works with a host of NASA missions and works on science activation and education. Over 20 years working with NASA missions at various institutions, her research has ranged from the sun's coronal mass ejections to the remnant shock waves from the supernovae. Hopefully, they're not too related, so that's... Uh, you know, would be a good thing to explore is the relationship between supernovae shock waves and coronal mass ejections. I'm sure that there's a relationship there someplace. But, uh, 
Uh, Kelly has been involved in building spaceflight hardware, working on a sounding rocket, and most recently co-led an East instrument suite on board NASA's Parker Solar Probe mission. So please welcome Dr. Kelly Korn. Thank you, thank you for that kind introduction. And um, I do always start off with the um, uh, the fact that yes, the sun will not go supernova. So that was a comparative basic physics study, not a, not an indication of anything that's wrong with the sun. Uh, so the sun will not go supernova. Everyone, everyone is safe. We're good. Um, so uh, again, my name is uh, Kelly Corrick, and I'm going to uh, chat today about what's up with the sun. Recent results from NASA's Parker Solar Probe. And um, a little bit about me first um, is uh, this is the mirrors that were used in the high C rocket. So me in the clean room, a little bit about my job. Um, I've It's varied over the years. And sometimes you suit up in a bunny suit and are inspecting mirrors. And again, my mirrors look a little different, right? They don't quite look like the mirrors that you see in a bathroom or that maybe you have in your car uh, visor. These are specifically for things in the ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet. So the wavelengths of light um, refle reflect a little bit differently. So it's not quite that silver that you normally see um, in a mirror. So that's uh, a little bit of time in the lab, a little bit of time out in the desert in White Sands, um, New Mexico, in order to launch that high sea rocket. So that optic is now, that mirror is now up there, that uh, gold plated um, or gold colored it's not gold plated, but gold colored um, telescope up there. And that was launched in 2012 uh, as the highest resolution images at the time of the sun's corona and really studying that very hot, um, hot region of the sun. And other parts of my job, I had worked on the Hinode telescope, which is uh, the X-ray telescope that's down here um, on this. And it's it, the artist's rendition is pointed the wrong way, not towards the sun, um, but that studied X-rays. So you actually skip the photons in, like you would skip a stone on, um, on a lake uh, because they, they're so high energy, they would otherwise just go right through, uh, much like when you get an X-ray of your hand. So that was another type of telescope I worked with. I uh, worked with Hubble data, um, so taking pictures of those faraway stars, of those stars that explode, and what they leave, what they, what uh, remnants they leave over, left that they leave behind, are things that I studied. Use the Chandra X-ray telescope. Uh, to also study those, those exploding stars and the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which are these four telescopes, the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly, which take a picture of the sun every 10 seconds um, and end up doing 1.7 terabytes of data a day, which is the equivalent to half a million YouTube or uh, uh, iTunes songs a day. And uh, so this is a lot of data. Um, it's geosync, uh, geosync orbit over New Mexico and constantly downloading that and making sure to take pictures of the sun and to really understand it. And then one of my favorite parts of the job is international collaboration. So this is a picture I think in, in Dublin of uh, Ireland of a variety of folks that I worked with on of, uh, various missions. I think this is the, one of the Hanode meetings. So um, again, a, a wonderful part of my job is really the international flavor um, that I've met people all over the world and all these scientists are working uh, for a common good to really understand the sun and uh, how it relates to the earth. And in my spare time, really, I adore the beach. Um, I also uh, happen to teach yoga. Um, so being uh, healthy and exercising is a large part of my life, as well as cupcakes are a very large part of my life. I uh, have a definite sweet tooth. And you might see an appearance today uh, of, uh, the, of my cat, um, as she is a pandemic cat and she is not used to me going to work uh, all these days. So being back home, she might, she might do a visit. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. And now back to the sun. Um, the sun gives us so many amazing things, um, like those warm beaches that I'm so fond of. Um, it makes the earth the right temperature for us to really survive and thrive here. Um, it's a comfortable temperature in most places. Um, and allows us to have liquid water, um, which is very important for uh, considering we're made up 70% of water. Um, it's very important for us to have liquid water. The sun also provides us food. So 
without the sun, uh, there is no uh, base of the um, base of the food chain in terms of plants um, and uh, the food that uh, the either the food that food eats or the food that we eat to nourish ourselves and to to enable us to uh, to do all of the amazing things humans do. The sun also entertains us and gives us these beautiful spectacles, um, such as the aurora, um, especially as we're going towards solar maximum, uh, there are more and more of these events. So this is when energetic particles shoot off the sun and interact with the Earth's magnet magnetic field that drag uh, them through the atmosphere. Um, and they excite the oxygen or nitrogen in the atmosphere that's in our makes up our at atmosphere. And then those um, atoms glow different colors, red or green um, or white or blue based on the, the composition of that um, or what's what the gas in the area is made up of. Um, and so the sun also provides these just absolutely beautiful, breathtaking um, displays, light displays. And again, as we go through this maximum, the sun goes through cycles. It goes through a time where it's not so active, um, maybe it throws off one or two of these events um, a week to a time where it does one to three to five of these a day. Um, so that's an 11 year cycle and we are on the ramp up of one of those cycles right now. So if we were to um, picture the sun, and again, we never look at the sun uh, with unprotected eyes, um, but if you can do it safely with a, a solar viewing um, filter or telescope, is uh, is that we would see a relatively yellow uh, surface in with our with our own uh, eyes through that filter, but yet we also see these. There is uh, seemingly marks on the sun, and these spots or the sun spots are a concentrated magnetic fields that happen uh, on the sun. And these are areas where then great activity uh, grow from them. So when I'm saying that the sun is getting more active, it's going to have more and more of these spots, more and more of this magnetic energy building up um, so that it, it will uh, interact with each other and uh, create space weather. And sunspots aren't a new thing. Um, in 11, 1128 uh, Common Era, uh, a monk actually recorded that there were sunspots on the sun's disk uh, by, by using a viewing, um, a viewing technique, was able to actually say there was something on, uh, on the disk, these, these sunspots were, were there. Um, and other, uh, there have been other records as well previous to this through either a fog or a haze. And again, not recommended to do this viewing, um, but in, you know, look at, you could look at the sun and see spots and differences and that has been recorded uh, throughout history. And a very beautiful uh, image from uh, Langley uh, drew, uh, drew these sunspots. So you can see there's this um, speckled pattern, which to me looks like um, bubbling of a um, bubbling of a, of a boiling pot of water. Um, there's also, we were talking earlier about the spaghetti, um, something uh, that looks kind of like spaghetti coming into the darker areas where again, the magnetic field is controlling the gas of the sun and uh, guiding it uh, in, with the magnetic strength um, along magnetic field lines. Um, so this is, and this is again, just one single part of the sun. It's not the entire sun. These are just the spots. Um, that, that have been studied for their magnetic properties. The video that you see here um, is a way to look at when that those magnetic fields and plasma actually leave the sun. Um, so you're seeing those stream out. The circle in the center is the, uh, is the size of the sun. The blue dot around it, the larger blue circle, um, is an occulter. So we're blocking out the brightest parts of the sun so that we can see the very faint, the million times fainter um, things that are coming off of the sun. And uh, in the background, you do see stars uh, because you can see a star, uh, star pattern in the back because again, you're blocking out most of the light from the sun. And through this, um, you're able to see uh, many things see if I can play it again. Um, you'll see 
a lot of material blow off. And those are coronal mass ejections. So the, um, we made reference to the spaghetti and these are kind of the meatballs or the, the bigger mass that, of the sun. Um, the, it is equivalent to 80, the, the weight of 80 million school buses uh, traveling at millions of miles an hour um, out throughout the heliosphere. The heliosphere is everything that the sun um, interacts with and, and its magnetic field kind of protects it much like our, our Earth's magnetosphere. Um, and uh, so these things are really, again, they go from about once a week um, during, the, uh, during the minimum to one to three, five, three to five times a day during maximum. So very active um, and something that we need to, uh, need to take into account as we become more spacefaring. So now looking at the size of these coronal mass ejections, here's an approximate size of the Earth. Again, the Earth is much further away um, than this, uh, than where this, um, uh, than where it is currently in this picture. Uh, but you can just get a sense of the scale of this is the beginning of a coronal mass ejection, um, and that's how big the Earth is. So it is actually very it's a very large phenomenon, and sometimes we only see part of it because it is such so large compared to the Earth. Um, and again, you'll see uh, what's interesting is these are now images from the Solar Dynamics Observatory that look an awful lot like, um, you know, like the Langley images with the roiling, boiling, the spaghetti-like hair um, that is covering the sun and the surface of the sun. And that's all the magnetic field, the plasma being funneled along the magnetic fields uh, that exist on the sun. So we wanted to go explore this up close and Parker Solar Probe has been 60 years in the making. And we're going because number one, we, were, we are explorers. Um, and just being curious and being able to go to um, each place uh, in the solar system, the Simpson Committee, actually the Space Studies Board in 1958, that also formed NASA, um, said that we should go to the sun and to every uh, planet in the solar system. And up on just before uh, Parker happened, we had hit all the other planets we just uh, needed to get to the sun. So it was kind of the last thing. And, and part of that is just the evolution of the technology. The technology to get there um, wasn't around in 1958. Um, some of the cameras, some of the um, the carbon carbon heat shield uh, fiber heat shield was not available. Um, water cooling radiators were probably there, uh, but some of the solar panel technology was not there. So all of those things had to come along and come together um, in order to have a mission um, that was uh, that was able to technologically. Um, so to, to try technologically get the science that we need. We're also going because of the practical matter of living with a star. As I was talking about, all of those coronal mass ejections, those energetic particles also that you saw coming to make the aurora, um, those things can affect airlines, they can affect uh, satellites, um, your cell phone, GPS, so all of those things um, all of those things really matter and trying to really understand how to live um, with a star is, in, is important. Um, and uh, the next part is also scientific curiosity as we have the closest plasma laboratory, the closest, uh, closest star uh, to us is the sun. And so it is great to get up close and to really start addressing some scientific um, questions that we really can't do when something is with the rest of the stars that are very, very far away. So looking again at those space weather drivers, especially with the larger flares, there's normally a coronal mass ejection associated with it. So flares are a violent reorganization of all those magnetic fields. So going from these beautiful loops uh, to them smashing together and, and, catac and cataclysmically reorganizing themselves, um, AKA exploding um, and pushing out a lot of energetic particles um, that again can come down and, and make aurora or affect um, uh, spacewalks or um, things like that. And it could also again, shoot up the coronal mass ejections. The biggest of the flares are normally uh, correlated with that. Um, and uh, those then coronal mass ejections again can come and uh, bring with them uh, some of that energy uh, that that could uh, could affect the thing, the technology at Earth. And when we have energetic electrons, they could damage uh, electrons, uh, spacecraft electronics. Um, they can also uh, 
cause changes in the ionosphere. So one of the layers of our Earth's atmosphere where we normally uh, use to bounce off uh, communication sing uh, say, uh, signals. And when we can't do that, when the ionospheric currents um, and it gets kind of jumbled by all of the space weather activity, um, it's hard to get J GPS to work. Um, you can't uh, navigate easily. It can also induce um, geomagnetic uh, currents in power systems. So when there are the long transmission lines, um, those can become overloaded. And if they can't become overloaded, you can um, blow transformers um, and basically take down um, some of the uh, some of the some of the um, power grid, which, um, especially in our technologically based life today, um, is it is something that we just. Uh, it would be catastrophic in terms of not having the cell phones, um, but very quickly, if you don't have uh, electricity for a long time, there's also uh, things such as life support from uh, pumping water stations, all of those other things um, are also affected if we do not have um, electricity flowing. And uh, there's also uh, effects on uh, pilots flying, uh, pilots and, and crew and, and uh, folks flying over poles when these things happen. So that's another time where we need to be able to tell um, what the sun is doing, when it's going to do it, um, because we can mitigate all of these all of these issues if we know that it's going to it's going to happen um, and we uh, we know ahead of time. So going back to that scientific curiosity is the sun is mysterious and it does it at least two weird things. It does a lot of weird things, um, but that at least two weird things that we're trying to figure out. So first of all, um, the sun is somewhat like a campfire. In the center of the sun, there is the energy or basically the, the burning logs, which would be equivalent to the uh, nuclear fusion that's happening in the core of the sun um, when we're smashing atoms together and giving off a lot of heat. So that's that fuel uh, that's creating that campfire. So it's super warm. And on Earth, when we have this campfire, we know that if we walk away from it or even a fireplace in, in um, in a, home, in a home, we know when we walk away from it, it gets colder. And as you go out of, of the sun's layers away from that core, it does get cooler. Uh, that yellow surface that you see is much cooler than the, than the core. However, as we keep going out, the atmosphere then gets warmer. So it's this weird thing where um, you have around 16 million degrees in the core, sorry, 16 million Kelvin in the core, and then the surface is around 6,000 and you go out to these prominences and the corona at a million and then 20 million for these flares. Um, so we've, we've walked away from a heating source and actually gotten warmer. Um, so there's a couple of ways that, that scientists think that this could happen. Um, and one of the, and this is why we're sending Parker there. So on the left, there is an image from Solar Dynamics Observatory. And uh, you're seeing here what looks like a, maybe a little bit of a tornado or at least twisting motion. Um, and that's one of the ways that, that uh, there's actually kind of a line here of magnetic, um, magnetic dancing, uh, dancing plasma. And that's one of the ways that scientists think we perhaps are heating the solar corona. Um, the magnetic fields that you see dancing are anchored into the surface of the sun um, through, and they come up through the surface of the sun and they're being kind of waved around. And as they wave around, that wave motion could, could create heat as, as the magnetic fields are, are moving. So that's one of the ways that it could possibly be heating the solar corona. So we wanted to get closer to see if, uh, if there's evidence that this really is um, heating uh, the corona. Another method, um, this is again on the right, is a image of the Solar Dynamics Observatory as a flare will go off. And um, over here, you'll see these and these reconnect uh, very white light, so lots of energy is in that area. And so perhaps that's how you heat this atmosphere that's around it. Um, and uh, so then the loops reconnect and, and do that cataclysmic reorganization um, and put, pull off more energy. So that is another way that folks thought that the, or folks think that uh, 
you could uh, heat the solar corona. So going up close again uh, to see if we're seeing the right amount of heating come off uh, of these events. So now Parker itself. Um, Parker was launched just about four years ago um, and it goes by Venus in order to uh, be pushed closer and closer to the sun. Um, the planets actually literally had to align so that we get seven different Venus assists in um, slowing us down and pushing us into the sun closer and closer. Um, we uh, have seven of these. And again, the, the prime mission is until 2025. Um, and uh, we will not be able to unfortunately get any closer uh, because surprisingly, it takes a lot of energy to fall into the sun. Um, and uh, we won't line up again with um, with Venus for I think another 92 years. Um, so there would be nobody to help us, no planet to help us um, to help us get closer. So once we get there, um, you know, we want to obviously uh, take data and understand more things. And um, we built models before we did any uh, any actual design. And this happens to be in a tech in a Texas um, uh, taco shop uh, that we built our, our model here and uh, used some uh, some foil and some uh, things to uh, to kind of imagine what's what's on the spacecraft. And uh, we you know, we wanted to make sure to take that temperature because that's one of the things that um, is a big puzzle. So we have to have something that is going to measure the temperature. Um, I was talking about a wind and uh, things flowing off of there. So we wanted something like an anemometer to uh, be able to, um, to be able to sample that wind. We wanted to measure magnetic fields because there's a lot of magnetic fields there. Um, and we want to take pictures because as any good travelers, you know, we have to have a lot of pictures as to where we go. And, and in the in the old days where we used to have slideshows, um, show, show everybody our slides. And I think these are probably much more interesting than most of the slideshows I sat through. Um, but anyway, uh, sweep is the solar wind, electrons, alphas and protons. And it's a uh, it is one of four instrument suites on Parker Solar Probe, and this was the one I was most involved with. So this is again my uh, my uh, my bias here for for these instruments. I love them all, but um, these are the three that I know kind of the most about. Um, the Solar Probe Cup is the bravest little cup. It actually peaks around the heat shield. It has its own heat shield um, in order to directly sample the wind. So this acts kind of as a temp, it, both a thermometer and an anemometer. So it tells, it tells you the direction um, and speed of the, um, of the wind. And uh, we have the solar probe analyzer, which also does, serves those two functions. Um, it's just a little more sophisticated than that cup, but, but hiding back here. Um, and then we have a solar probe analyzer for electrons and, and ions on the ahead. So A is ahead, B is behind. A, so the spacecraft travels towards the sun in this direction. So that's ahead and then behind is the, is the uh, B, B direction. And we have this nice satellite dish to talk to, uh, talk to Deep Space Network to download our data. Uh, we have these beautiful solar panels, um, which were designed specially to be able to tilt up. So normally folks fly with their, um, the solar panels full out. Uh, but because it's so hot and they would actually burn up exposed to that much sun, they have to actually pull in and just put out their very fingertips, the very end of their uh, end of the um, end of the the panel in order to be water cooled and not burn up in uh, that close proximity to the sun. Um, so and there is in addition to that, there are there are the fields antennas out front, um, the heat shield a um, water, water cooled radiator um, in this section, in this section of water cooled radiators. Uh, there's a magnetic boom on the back. Uh, there, this is a particle, det energetic particle detector. And on this side is also the whisper camera, the camera that we brought along for the scientific exploration. So what sweeps measures is um, a velocity distribution function, which is um, kind of a fancy way to say that we measure the velocity in the speed and the direction of the particles, um, the density and the temperature of the solar wind. Uh, so we take the number of particles for a given energy and um, 
the center of where that is, is the velocity um, and how much of there, how many of those are, we count all those up and that's the density of how many particles are in the, in the sample. And then the spread of the, um, of the velocity is, uh, gives you a temperature. Um, and so it makes this, these maps of electrons or alphas and protons as a function of direction and energy. And this is a, a glamour shot of the uh, solar probe cup, uh, Board Parker solar probe. And uh, like I was describing before, is it has its own heat shield. Um, so that little uh, heat shield uh, keeps it nice and nice and uh, cozy, able to, to make uh, these uh, electronic measurements. Um, and there is actually back here uh, an electronic box that hides behind the big heat shield um, and that uh, and that's where all of our data is processed into signals. Um, and uh, when originally designing this cup, there was a lot of thought put into obviously the types of materials um, and things like that. And at one point in time, there was a design for the cup that had diamonds, sapphires, and rubies involved. And so I was all about this instrument. I was, you know, sign me up and where are the spares? Um, but uh, what happened was the diamonds were, uh, the diamond would have been, uh, Dim uh, silicon carbide to make those grids and it was too brittle to survive launch. Um, there was also rubies that did not work out well as insulators, um, but we did end up with uh, with actually sapphires in the um, in the thing. Uh, in the, the cup. We couldn't use aluminum, uh, which is another common metal um, because it would melt. Um, so instead, it's made of tungsten, molybdenum, nubidium, uh, titanium and sapphire. Um, and the sapphire is right there. Um, it, it is white lab grown uh, silica uh, sapphire um, that acts as a standoff insulator. And I don't have any of the spare pieces. <laughs> um, and another thing we do, uh, so we shake these instruments really hard when you're on a rocket. Um, there's a lot of vibration and you wanna make sure that the screws don't somehow fall out through that vibration. So you normally use a little bit of epoxy um, just to make sure that they stay in. Um, but with these, this heat, you just can't use a glue. There's no glue that's really gonna, gonna do that. So instead everything was safety wire. These really little screws, um, I think they're double knot screws with uh, then wire together, everything is wired together so that they wouldn't fall out and injure something else on the spacecraft as we were, um, as we were launching. So uh, that's another consideration that we had to do. Another piece of this is actually um, that normal test facilities are insufficient. Um, most of the time uh, you would look for just something in deep space and, and uh, be able to test in a vacuum system in a vacuum chamber that would pull out most of the air and, and simulate space. Um, but we were also going super close to the sun um, with all this heat, which is something that's very different for most space missions. Uh, so a little ingenuity was needed and um, the ingenuity came from repurposing IMAX film projectors. So there are one, two, three, and there's a fourth one hanging, hiding back there, um, IMAX film projector. So instead of expanding out into five stories, actually condensing that bulb and focusing it in, it's a relatively good approximation for a solar spectrum um, for that light that they were gonna see. Granted, it takes about four of them to, um, to get the same intensity uh, to where, how close we're going to the sun. And we also had to put this, this uh, nicely wrapped in tin foil um, is a uh, particle accelerator. So a mini little uh, particle beam that was also shown to the cup. So the cup could be hot and it could actually prove that it was going to be able to measure uh, the particles. Cause that's very important is to prove everything before you, um, before you send it off uh, into space. Many, many, many tests were done uh, it, uh, it, through this integration and testing period of the of the sun of the of the Parker Solar Probe, and uh, this is a beautiful image of testing the solar array. So testing each line and seeing if it's going to have enough power to power the instruments and power the navigation and the uh, telecom that's needed um, for the spacecraft. Um, so they were testing all these, and these again are the little fingertip ones um, that will that power us while we're closest to the sun. 
So this is uh, the Parker Solar Probe in the fairing, so the top of the very top of the rocket just before she was launched. So there's going to be another side that comes in and kind of closes on closes in on that one on the what you're seeing there. Um, and uh, highlighted is the cup um, right around the um, looking around the heat shield, um, span A and span B, and uh, you see the the um, power the uh, solar panels. The and field antennas are tucked in, um, and they are later they were released a day or two after launch. And then this is the um, magnetic tail magnetic uh, measurement that that kind of sticks out like a little tail. Um, and then some of the other instruments are over on that side. Um, so and this is uh, her rocket on a Delta IV heavy because we needed all that to get us directly to Venus, and it really did put us right in a direct path to Venus, which was. Um, great because that saves some of the um, some of the fuel for uh, for us to point because this heat shield has to be pointed directly at the sun. If it is ever askew, um, any of these instruments were to see that the full sunlight, the spacecraft would burn. So um, we well would scorch and uh, melt. So we can't have any of that. So we have to make sure it's very um, precisely pointed. And there are, there's fuel in uh, little jets that make micro corrections to make sure to keep it uh, pointed at the sun. So again, the people um, of this, there's just an amazing, amazing uh, group that put this together. And this is such a small, small amount of this. There are so many more engineers um, and folks who worked in, you know, machine shops as well as uh, contracts and grants and all of these other things that um, helped make this happen. So the top picture is myself and Tony Case, the instrument scientist, and um, Chris Schultz, uh, who is the integration specialist um, with the cup just before it uh, was integrated into the spacecraft and anything red is taken off before launch. So that was just how to hold it and fix fix it onto the uh, on spacecraft. There's some fun folks from the launch uh, launch vehicle, the Delta IV launch team, uh, Kennedy. Um, and then a lot of scientists. And uh, this is, again, just a small, small snippet. Um, this is about a few few months before launch, um, Dr. Parker, Eugene Parker, the namesake, um, was there and uh, we had the pleasure of hearing him talk and about his discovery. And his story is really a story of persistence um, and believing in yourself. Uh, he first theorized about the solar wind in 1958 and um, wrote a paper to that effect. And it was rejected multiple times because it was new and different and, uh, you know, the scientists just didn't believe him. And finally, the editor looked at it and said, well, you know, the math seems right. So, you know, are you willing to kind of stake, you know, should should we stake, you know, your reputation on this? And he said, you know, I, I guess. And um, and through that persistence, he was able to, uh, you know, be the. The, the lead in uh, founding basically this field and, and this field of study. Um, and then uh, Marsha Neubauer uh, also used some of the earliest measurements of the solar wind and confirmed that there was a solar wind um, a year or two later um, through some other experiments. So this is really um, a great, a great story and very aptly named for Gene. And uh, unfortunately he passed away this year, but was able to see his spacecraft launch. And now uh, some of those pictures that were sent back from this beautiful spacecraft um, is, uh, this is a comet a picture, uh, one of just the first pictures we happened to happen to get as we were, um, as we were commissioning. And uh, we got some bonus science. So, you know, the original uh, goals of Parker was really to study the sun. However, we visit Venus seven times and we currently don't have a mission at Venus. Um, so we were able to uh, turn on some of the instruments and uh, take data around Venus. So this was a uh, kind of getting uh, more bang for your buck out of this mission. And uh, this was a picture of Venus taken by the Whisper instrument. You can kind of see um, some of the solar wind interacting with the uh, with Venus. This area is um, uh, the uh, Venetian Highland, um, and uh, your the streakiness. Uh, you're seeing part some particles as well as some dust uh, that a uh, dust streak um, on the cameras for for um, from Whisper. 
And then this is a 1990s radar of Venus and then the whisper images that were taken as well. Um, so kind of doing a little bit of a rotation of the image and seeing that we really are seeing um, that terrestrial, um, the terrestrial features of Venus or Venetian features, not terrestrial, Venetian features um, on, on the whisper uh, data. So there were um, there were other things that were found, um, you know, in uh, that that come in and out of the solar system. Things like meteorites, there's uh, or come from inside the solar system and, and kind of rain down things like meteorites. Um, and uh, that is one of the discoveries that Whisper has actually had is that. Um, Normally, dust grains are something that you know we don't really care about, or where we went out of our houses in uh, in uh, on Earth. Um, but dust grains are really left over from the beginning of the planetary system that we live in. And uh, but as the sun formed and heated up, you do definitely break break up those things, and and dust doesn't stick around. Um, either it became part of a planet, or there are some rings left out uh, left from where we, we didn't, and I'll replay this again, um, but there are different types of, of, um, of this dust um, and meteor streams. And um, they, some of them are understood, some of them aren't. And as we are flying closer and closer, we're, in, we're encountering different bits of dust. And so Parker is doing this dust and, and meteorite and basic, um, kind of some basic understanding of how planets and planetary systems evolve um, that we didn't, again, you know, was definitely not in our original thoughts, but, but the instruments are performing so well. So again, um, there are beta meteorites that are escaping the solar system due to the pressure of sunlight. So that's where you see all the blue, uh, the simulations of the blue, blue um, arrows going outward. Um, and that was something that was known. And then um, for Parker, some of it is tracing all of that and tracing how much of that dust is actually um, coming from the middle uh, from the sun and, and close up to the sun. And um, again, these meteorites, meteoroid streams collide with the dust as well. And they can uh, also do more concentrated sprays. Um, of uh, the of those meteorites as they're leaving, um, so that's that's another thing that Parker was able to fly through and actually confirm. So the other so moving a little bit bigger as to things that that fall off the sun. This is a stereo image of the sun um, that warmer. It's a little bit warmer atmosphere. And although there's a little bit of um, you know movement here, we don't really see very much, right? You don't see the dramatic um, coronal mass ejections that you saw from in that blue movie, in the blue the blue Lasco movie um, that was at the beginning. But when you take a difference, so you subtract one in, one uh, image from the last, you can actually tell what changed between the two of them. So when you do that, you're starting to see that there is a coronal mass ejection coming out to the left. And it happened that Parker was flying through that um, at, during our first orbit. So with coronal mass ejections, I was say I was giving some stats earlier about like about once a week during minimum and a, you know, a couple times a day during maximum. And that you know, we started actually at a minimum. Well, Parker was launched at a minimum in solar activity. Um, and so we didn't expect, we did the calculations and because of where our orbits were, we thought that we might see seven coronal mass ejections in seven years. So basically one a year, just based on trajectory and things like that. We saw two within the first four months. So we were, um, we were very, uh, very uh, happy about that because that gives us a chance to see them. And then these again are, um, you know, pictures that basically only the scientists can love. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to hope that uh, y'all can start uh, liking these too. So um, this is Parker Solar Probe data. So the sweep data and fields data. So it's not the pretty pictures, but this is the particle data. Um, and the magnetic fields, um, what you're looking for in terms of a coronal mass ejection is that there's a twist. There's a twist in the magnetic field. So we're looking for blue to go from negative to positive, um, and both blues are kind of uh, twisting. 
then we're looking at rate of velocity kind of going up. So there's a little, little uh, peak over there. We're looking for some proton density um, here, as well as this temperature dropout that is an indication that we have cold plasma that we kind of dug up and ejected with, with this coronal mass ejection. So this was the first coronal mass ejection that Parker Solar Probe uh, saw in November of uh, 2018. And again, we launched in um, August of 2018. So it was very, very quick that we found our first coronal mass ejection. So what's next uh, for Parker? Uh, so September 6, very soon, we're going to have perihelion uh, 13. There are uh, 25 total. Uh, December 11th will then be another one. So this is going to get pretty quick for a while. Um, Venus flyby, meaning we're going to break our own speed and distance record. By the way, Parker is the fastest human-made object, as well as uh, the closest human-made object to the sun. Um, so she'll break her own speed and distance record on um, after uh, after August of next year, so a year from now. And then her final um, uh, breaking her own speed and distance record will be in November of 2024. Um, and then the final perihelion in December of 2025. Um, so that's what's next up for Parker. But the sun does not disappoint. Uh, well, actually, the moon takes, takes a little credit here, too. Uh, so upcoming are the eclipse uh, 2023 um, and the annular eclipse on Saturday, October 14th, 2023 is going to cross across uh, eight U.S. states. Um, and most of the continental of the U.S. will get a partial eclipse. Uh, but this is this path uh, through Oregon, uh, Nevada, a little bit of California, um, Utah, um, Four Corners area, Texas will all get, and then down through South America, Central and South America, will get an annular eclipse or what's sometimes called a ring of fire. And then in uh, 2024 is another total solar eclipse. So for those who enjoy, enjoyed the uh, experience of the 2017 eclipse, um, there's going to be another chance. Um, and this is the next chance for about 40 years. So it's really uh, time to uh, enjoy this. And uh, it's going to go through Mexico, up through 13 states, and then out through Canada. Um, and uh, all of the U.S., the continental U.S., again, will experience some uh, some part of it. But for those eclipse watchers or in chasers around us, if you know anyone, they'll tell you, you know, totality is worth it, is worth getting to that center line. But it's also amazing that you're going to see an eclipse anywhere. And it's a great way to um, to stay home and learn something. Um, it is April 8th, so there, there might be some school, uh, school considerations that you want to stay close to home, but you can still view, uh, safely view the sun uh, through viewing glasses or alternate um, viewing methods. So what is a total solar eclipse? Um, it happens when the moon passes between the sun and the earth and completely blocks the, the face of the sun. And this is again, the total solar eclipse. Uh, the annular one happens when uh, the earth, or, sorry, the moon is actually at its furthest. So it, wait a minute, it's closest so that it can't actually, um, it can't actually cover the entire disk of the sun. Um, and uh, people, but this is for the, for the total, um, the, folks in the shadow will be able to see the total eclipse. The sky is going to become very dark as if it was dawn or dusk. Uh, birds come to roost. Um, and uh, during a total solar eclipse, if you know skies are clear, you can really see that corona, those mass ejections, those things like that, or any prominences that are on there um, with your own eyes. Um, and only that is the only safe time to view the sun is during totality. Um, during all other phases of an eclipse, uh, like these shown here, you would have your solar viewing glasses or you'd be using um, filters or some other method um, and not, not regular sunglasses, but total solar eclipse glasses um, to see these and uh, to see those. And so again, uh, the next one would be on April 8th. And we're not just uh, Talk, we're not just doing the the, um, the eclipses, but it's going to be a very big year for the sun uh, from fall of 2023 to the end of 2024. So hence, it's a big year. Um, and we really want to bring the joy and curiosity um, to really an opportunity of a lifetime to experience as many parts of the sun and, and interaction with the sun as, as we can. Um, there's various ways to participate. We are looking to do a lot of citizen science at this point in time. So citizens um, able to do um, research 
research-based uh, uh, work with, uh, with folks to, uh, to really make discoveries here. And so, uh, you know, I will make sure to get these slides so that folks can take a, take a look at this if they're interested in participating. And the big year comes from actually a birding term uh, that is you try to see as many bird species in one year that you can. So what we're kind of challenging folks to do is to see as many different um, solar uh, phenomena in one year that you can. So can you see an aurora? Can you see a total solar eclipse, an annular eclipse? Um, what about, you know, it's solar max as well. Um, we're building up to the, the very active sun. So can you say, can you see that? All those things are gonna be, um, are gonna be available. So it's really gonna be a big year and an exciting time between fall 23 and 24. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. And we do indeed have some good questions here. And so uh, if you have any more, uh, please put them in the Q&A window. So uh, one of the things you talked about uh, the, the probe and you kind of talked about the lifetime of the probe, mm -hmm. but then what happens to the Parker Solar Probe after the mission? I think you said that perihelion number 26 was the last one. And so what happens after that? Right, so um, 26 is the last of the prime mission. So technically, as long as we have fuel, um, we can go a little bit longer. Now the calculations range from about 10 years longer. Um, it's not infinite, but maybe maybe another 10 years. So maybe we'll get another 30 orbits in, maybe. Um, and uh, depending on funding and, and health of the spacecraft. But um, after that's all exhausted, um, we will unfortunately uh, shut, basically shut, shut it down and it will end up turning to its side and the side will see the sun and will melt. Um, and so the entire thing will melt into a little ball and uh, just stay a little, um, a little orbiting satellite at that, uh, at the same trajectory that we've been at for that in uh, the last orbit. So um, it's not a spectacular. We wanted to figure out how to like launch ourselves into the sun and like you know blaze of glory, but um, it's surprisingly hard to. If you have no more fuel left, you can't get go, get anywhere. So. Okay, so kind of sticking with the idea of the temperature of the sun, we have a, a question that uh, the surface temperature of the sun is this, more or less the same as the center of the earth. If geothermal energy were fully developed, do you think that global warming would increase because of the harvesting heat at depth to the surface of the earth? Hmm. Okay, well, that's interesting. So if we use, if we use the, the heat in the center, um, but if we're converting it to, uh, if we're converting it to energy, I don't know if we would we would necessarily release it all directly to the atmosphere. So I don't know if it would would affect really the atmosphere much, you know, much more negatively or or create much more heat in the atmosphere um, because it should be mo if it's efficient, it should be going into the doing using its energy to do whatever work or or um, thing that it power, whatever it's, it's doing. So I, I don't think so. I think it should, yeah, should these be lar okay. large, uh, uh, you know, theoretical geoengineering projects are, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of hard to model them and know what they might look like. Exactly. Kind of in the same vein, thinking about global warming, how much of global warming is uh, perhaps attributed to the sun um, in addition to the year, 11-year uh, sun cycle or coronal mass ejections or other phenomena increasing that can impact global warming. And so what, what do we notice about long-term trends with the earth or with the sun, I guess? Right. And, and overall, um, with the sun, from uh, what I understand of the models, the sun is kind of a 1 to 10 percent effect on the temperature of the earth. Um, but hasn't changed at that level, at the same level that the actual warming of the earth has, right? So um, the trend for the warming of the earth is constantly up or consistently up, whereas, uh, whereas the, you know, the sun would have a cycle. So you would think that, okay, well, if it was really the sun, there should then be a, a cycle to the warming as well. Um, and, you know, there's not at the there's not at the bulk level, like there might be little changes, you know, like if, if you're going up three degrees, it's like 0.1 degree is the sun and everything else is, is, uh, is uh, other sources. 
And I guess that's a that's an interesting question to kind of extend that is is how much of the research that the Parker Solar Probe is doing can help us understand solar cycles and its influence on the Earth environment as well as the other environments within the solar system. Definitely, and um, so Parker looks at a lot of how many you know how many times are we getting those energetic particles, how much of the coronal mass ejections are coming out, because from one view, um, you only, you know, if you're, if you're only on earth, you only see one view, but Mars could be over here and Jupiter could be over here. So as we become spacefaring um, society, you know, we don't, the, the uh, space weather predictions for the earth or, or forecast for the earth is different than that could be different from that at Mars. It could be stormy here and it could be fine here or it could, or vice versa. Um, so Parker is looking at that and trying to um, really get the basic data uh, for how many times these things happen um, and then putting them into models to kind of, to understand them. So um, it is helping us understand that as well as then understand the atmosphere, um, it, the interactions of, hey, this is incoming, what happens as you're um, at Earth then. Uh, so then we also understand that propagation. Great. So, you, and, and then there's kind of a mystery about, uh, you know, what exactly the probe is, is measuring. And so we have a, an interesting question. Of how do you accurately measure the speed of the probe as it's moving through space? When the SPC picks up the wind, how does it know how fast the wind was going compared to its own speed? Definitely, yeah. So, um, so we have the data from the uh, the trackers that are on board that are sent back to Earth. Uh, we'll know, and then you do ranging. So you do know if I have to contact it, and at one second it's here, and one second it's there. You can then create a, a map as to how fast it's, or figure out how fast it's going. Um, so we're able to figure out how fast the, the probe is going. And then the, um, the the Faraday cup measures those particles coming in. So they come in. Uh, within probably, uh, I think it's one, it, between one eighth and one, one, one twenty eighth of a, of a second. Um, it tells you where the particles are um, and how fast they're going. Um, what that equates to again is what is the peak number? So where do most of those stack up? We count them really, really, really fast um, and say, okay, so this is where most of them stack up. Um, we, we say that that's the velocity of the, those particles. Now, it, the cup doesn't know about how fast the, the spacecraft is going. So then when it comes down to Earth, we have to say, okay, we have the spacecraft data and we have our cup data and we can either add or subtract based on the direction you're moving um, and which the particles are moving and then get the, the speed of the particles that without the speed of the, um, the spacecraft interfering. Okay. It's all a matter of figuring out what your frame of reference is. So, exactly. It's all about frame of reference, yes. So we have another question. Is, uh, is the extra heat from upwelling and squished plasma being contained by the magnetic fields at the corona? And like you said, colder below, squished, and hotter at the top? Uh, is not the extra heat from upwelling yeah. and squished plasma being, being contained, contained by the magnetic by the maybe um, some of it is being contained by the magnetic field and then, and then yes, that could, that causes the heat to kind of go through the atmosphere, right? Because as you're just pushing up heat, it, it can uh, uh, conduct away uh, into, uh, or convect away into, uh, into other parts of the atmosphere. So that is one, uh, one part of it, yeah. So that's an interesting question too. You know, we actually we have a couple of things here about the the motion of the spacecraft too. What adjustments can you make, or do you have to make, uh, to the spacecraft orientation as it gets close um, to perihelion? Yeah. So definitely to perihelion, we have to make sure that that uh, that front heat shield is pointed directly to the sun. And again, that is a bunch of star trackers and autonomy telling it, hey, I might be seeing a star. So make sure to, you know, do a little adjustment here, a little adjustment there, um, making sure that you're lined up with the, the whole star pattern. Um, and uh then there is, uh, I think, also light sensors that if they were to sense anything, kind of, again, do a little micro adjustments uh, back and forth. Um, so yeah, so those are those are some adjustments that we have to do. Um, when we also come out of uh, 
close further away from the sun. Uh, there are sometimes turns of the spacecraft so that you turn that antenna towards the earth so it could actually see because you do need a line of sight in order to do the transmission of data. Um, so we do when we're further away turn the spacecraft a little sometimes to get the um, to get the data. Okay. And this is an interesting question. It's, um, you know, and, and I think it relates to, um, I mean, I kind of extended it a little bit. What's the maximum solar latitude that Parker can read data from? And would that be an important thing because some of the uh, phenomena that you see on the sun are maybe dependent on their latitude? And so does it make a difference for how far north or south you can get? It does. Um, there are, um, especially with the activity, there are, ends up with bands. Um, so the sun is a approximately a sphere, um, and there will become bands of magnetic activity, and they, through their cycle, uh, kind of go up and down, move up and down in this in the sun. Um, and so it's important because you you will might you might get something different in the in the. Uh, northern and southern hemisphere. Um, so it is important. And there is a sister probe, um, Solar Orbiter, a, a joint program with the uh, European Space Agency that actually will, through its orbit, instead of getting, it gets close, but then it stops and kind of just starts going higher. So it will look down on the sun um, from a pole, um, only about 20 degrees, but it will be able to see a different, um, a, a different angle. And so that's important to put together the three dimensions. Um, cause in some ways, you know, probe is kind of one point, uh, but now you have another point up here. So you're starting to get that 3d picture of what's really happening. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. We've got a uh, time for just, uh, let's go two more questions. And, um, so here's, um, Here's one I'm not quite sure that I understand what this is, but I'm, I'm sure you do. Maybe you alluded to it. Is Are we getting any closer to figuring out switchbacks? That's a good question. So switchbacks um, are were announced uh, last, it was last December or the December beforehand. Um, from what we saw with Park Rose, we, we saw um, the magnetic field doing these like switchbacks. So you would almost get the almost seemed like you were kind of like whipping around with the um, with the magnetic field very quickly, which magnetic fields is a, don't really like to do that. They're a little stiffer. So uh, trying to figure out what uh, what was going on there and whether that was a part or a signature of the heating that was happening um, there um, and that the energy, you know, kind of flowing through these, um, they're much more common. We, we had seen them before in Helios data, which was in the 80s, um, but uh, was not uh, not quite as frequent um, as, uh, as that. So we are getting more data and there are... Um, there are papers in press. I think there'll be probably some more announcements in December timeframe around the AGU about switchbacks. So, yep. And then one thing, I, I, I think that there's been a, a couple of questions about this, and I know that you uh, dealt with it a lot, but maybe you could recap for uh, a couple of the, the people that post questions is about what we've learned about why the corona is so much hotter than the other layers of the sun. And uh, I, I guess, why is that important to us here on earth to know? Right. And it's, it's important for us because that's where a lot of the space weather is coming from. That's really one of the most, one of kind of the most relevant um, in space is uh, the fact that we see those energetic particles coming, uh, coming off from that layer. Um, those flares are happening there, um, getting super hot and throwing off the energetic particles that then again can affect astronauts if they're spacewalking or, or down a power grid. Um, and then the coronal mass ejections again that can um, uh, have drag effects on satellites and, and uh, impact us as well. So those are um, those are part of the reasons why we care why it's so hot. Um, and then it is the scientific curiosity of, OK, how does the star work? Um, and so if our star works this way, um, can we figure out how other stars work um, similarly farther away? And again, then solve other um, other evolutionary of the universe uh, questions or even exoplanets, looking at how exoplanets, other planets, exoplanets um, can uh, become habitable as well. All right. And I'm just going to, you know, add one more question. And so personally, what's, uh, what aspect of this mission is uh, most exciting to you and that you're most looking forward to? Um, so what I think that I am uh, most excited about is actually uh, to continue to go deeper and deeper into the corona. 
um, we have touched our star um, that was declared last December is that we actually were in the um, in the, the Corona. Um, and that was the goal, one of the goals is to spend time there to study that. Um, and things change, the, the gas and the plasma change when you switch from being outside of that to inside of the, what they call the Alphane surface or the surface that, that changes the characteristics from inside the star to outside the star. Um, and so that was the first thing I was looking forward to. And now it's spending more time there and really getting to know it over the solar cycle. So getting up to solar max and being like, okay, well, how does it change? So we've kind of seen it as the like the more calm, calm sun and like what happens when it's very active and, and changing quickly um, and what new things we can do and seeing how, how over the next, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, folks use this data in different ways as well. Um, watching the next generation come up and, um, and use this data to make new discoveries that we just haven't even thought of yet. All right. Well, it's a very exciting mission and, and I'm you know, looking forward to uh, uh, you know, some more really great discoveries. So definitely. Well, that's all for tonight, everyone. Thank you very much, Kelly, for joining us this evening. And thank you everyone for tuning in. You can find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities. Tonight's presentation will also be on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel. And also join us for our next webinar on Monday, September 19th, when Dr. Joseph Lazio from NASA's JPL will share with us some recent discoveries through the use of radio telescopes. Also join us on Wednesday, two days from now, August 24, for a special International Observe the Moon Night webinar. Um, you know, that moon plays a big role in uh, some of these events that are coming up with the eclipses. And so, but it's something that's accessible to us. And um, in some ways, when we look at the moon, we're kind of looking at the sun because guess where that light from the moon comes from? It's just reflected sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll see our perennial webinar favorite, Andrea Jones. So keep looking up. And that's uh, this Wednesday, August 24th. So keep looking up and we'll see you in two days and next month. So good night, everyone.